88 and 89. And so I am going to go ahead and plan now to stretch this over the next two classes at the very least. Uh, but there was method in my madness in choosing these two psalms and sort of lumping them together. And just very briefly, it, it goes something like this. In this class in particular, I feel like that most of us have a reasonably good working understanding of the tabernacle as it's presented in the Law of Moses and the worship that surrounds the tabernacle. What I would suggest that maybe we could stand to dig a little deeper on is how the worship of God developed in the time of David and Solomon leading into the worship in the temple that grows out of the tabernacle worship but becomes in many ways much more intricate. Um, and I believe looking at these psalms is sort of a segue into getting some background on that concept. And so I'm going to start tonight by trying to orient us in time and place and setting and then we'll get into the text of Psalms 88 and 89 as time permits. Um, looking back to our timeline, uh, you remember that in this period here in the center of the timeline, we have that period of United Kingdom lasts for approximately 120 years. And uh, during that time, Saul, David, and Solomon in succession were each kings over Israel, each reigning for a period of about 40 years. Um, Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, the only king that God anointed from the tribe of Benjamin, and then David and his dynasty lasts as long as there is a kingdom in Judah. Um, and he is from the tribe of Judah, of course, as God had prophesied by the mouth of Jacob back when Jacob was dying, that the scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. So David then becomes king. And when we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 5, and we read verses 3 through 5, Samuel records there that David was recognized as king by Israel when he was 30 years old. Now remember that God had sent Samuel down to Bethlehem in 1 Samuel chapter 16 to anoint David when David was but a boy. But it's not until he's 30 years old that he is recognized and accepted, as it were, as the king of all Israel. And he reigns for a period of 40 years from the time he's 30 until about 70 then. And we also learn in 2 Samuel 5 that the first seven years of David's reign, he reigned from the town of Hebron. And then the remaining 33 years of his reign was in Jerusalem. Now that's important in giving us a little bit of temporal and geographical context to what we're going to look at. Because when David comes to move to Jerusalem, he doesn't just call the moving truck and pack up his things and move to Jerusalem. He has to conquer Jerusalem because the Jebusites reside there. And so he conquers the Jebusites. He drives them out of Jerusalem. He makes it his stronghold. He builds, according to 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 1 Chronicles chapter 15, houses there. And then he moves to bring the Ark of the Covenant of God to Jerusalem. Now, remember that during all of this time, the Ark of the Covenant of God has not been in the tabernacle. It had been taken down to Philistia in the days of Saul. It had caused all kinds of problems for the Philistines, and so they put it on a cart and sent it out of Philistia back to Israel, and it had resided there for a period of 20 years. So putting all of that information together, I think it's probably fair to say that it was probably something like at least about 10 years into the reign of David when he reaches out to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the city of Jerusalem. At a bare minimum, it had to be seven because he reigned in, in uh, Hebron for seven years before he comes to Jerusalem. But given the fact that he had to conquer Jerusalem, and then we uh, are told in 1 Chron Chronicles 15, 1, that he built houses there, and then he brought the Ark, uh, the Ark to Jerusalem. Three years doesn't seem unreasonable to do all of that. And so maybe about 10 years into his reign, 
he reaches out to bring the ark to Jerusalem. Now, you remember the famous story that he um, is bringing the ark to Jerusalem, but they bring it initially on an ox cart. The same way, by the way, that the Philistines sent it out of their land into Israel. And not at all the way that God had prescribed in the law of Moses that the ark was to be moved from place to place. And the incident resulted in the death of Uzzah. Remember, because Uzzah reached out and steadied the ox cart that the ark was on, and he touched the ark, which was forbidden, and he died. And David was upset and angry over that matter, and he inquired of God, and then he ultimately, three months later, decides to get his act together and do it the right way, and sends the Levites down there to carry it on poles on their shoulders, the way God had instructed, and they bring the ark to the city of Jerusalem. Now, all of that is important because that is the setting where David begins to appoint the singers of Israel. And the singers of Israel are some of the chief individuals who are authors of Psalms. Now, we've already been doing a little bit of dabbling in some of the Psalms of Asaph without saying a whole lot about who Asaph was. Tonight, I want to give you the big picture on who Asaph was, as well as the writers of Psalms 88 and 89, who are Heman and Ethan. When we go back to the law of Moses, you remember that the, the tribe of Levi was designated and set apart, separate from the other tribes. They were designated to the service of God. When the land was divided up in the land of Canaan, the Levites were not given a plot of land that just pertained to the, the tribe of Levi the way many of the other tribes were, were given. But instead, they would live among the Israelites. They would, they would populate the cities of refuge later on, and things of that nature. But they didn't just have a section of land that belonged to the tribe of Levi. They were dedicated to the service of God. Now, in the book of Numbers, chapter 4, Numbers outlines the duties of the three clans within the tribe of Levi with respect to the worship of God in the tabernacle. You had the first clan, the clan of Kohath. They were responsible, and I'm condensing this down into one word labels, hopefully for the sake of memory. Um, they were responsible, essentially, for the furniture of the tabernacle for its care, for its upkeep, and most notably for its transportation from place to place. All of it was carried by means of sliding poles through sockets and carried on the shoulders of the Kohathites, okay? Then you had the Gershonites who were responsible, again, one word label, for the fabrics, if you will, of the tabernacle. All of the hangings and the coverings and the cloth and the curtains and all of those things were their responsibility. And then you had the Marerites, the third clan, who were responsible for what we might call the hardware of the tabernacle, the posts and the beams and the sockets and all of those sorts of things. The Gershonites and the Marerites were actually given ox-drawn carts to transport their portions of the tabernacle. The Kohathites were not because, again, the furniture of the tabernacle was to be carried on the shoulders of these, these Levites. Okay? When we begin to break the family of Kohath down even further, there are four sort of sub-clans or sub-families. The first of which is attributable to Amram. Anybody remember the name of Amram without looking at the rest of what I've written? <laughs> Amram and Yoshebed were the parents of Moses and Aaron and Miriam, right? So from his family, of course, descends Moses the lawgiver, Aaron, who is the forefather of all the priests. All priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests, right? Only the, the, only the Levites who were descended from Kohath and then within Kohath from Aaron could be priests. And, of course, the high priest was the oldest living male direct descendant of Aaron who met all the qualifications to be a priest, okay? And then you had these three other families. I tell you all of that not just to give you a whole bunch of useless information, but because when David begins to assemble the singers of Israel, the chief singer of Israel is a man by the name of Heman. Heman descends from the Izhar branch of the clan of Kohath within the Levite family. And when we get over to 1 Chronicles chapter 15 that describes 
how these men are commissioned and the work that they're commissioned to do, it said that he stood in the center. And then to his right is this individual named Asaph, whose psalms we've been reading for the past few times we've studied together. Asaph is descended from the family of Gershon. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Heman is a grandson of Samuel the prophet, by the way. Um, the son of Samuel's son, Joel. And then Ethan, who is the uh, author or the writer, the Holy Spirit's the author, okay, writer, the human person who put pen to, ink, uh, pen to paper uh, of Psalm 89, he's descended from that third major division of the Levites, the Merarites. So you have all the major divisions of the Levites represented in these singers of Israel. Now, when we get over to 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 31, there's a notation made there that Solomon was extremely wise, and specifically his wisdom is said to have exceeded a group of four men who include Heman and Ethan, who is designated there as the Ezraite. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you read the headings to your psalms that we're looking at tonight, both Heman and Ethan are designated as Ezraites. I cannot tell you what an Ezraite is. I have tried and tried and tried to find a satisfactory definition, and all I have found is that every commentary that I read has a different idea about what it means than the last one I read. I really don't know what an Ezraite is. Uh, I feel reasonably comfortable in telling you that the Heman and Ethan who wrote Psalms 88 and 89 are the same Heman and Ethan that we meet here in these passages that I've given you who were appointed to be singers of Israel. And they are also described as David's seers or advisors or prophets. Of course, the prophet's one who speaks for God, so it's not too surprising to find them writing inspired writings. And they are considered evidently extremely wise because 1 Kings 4.31 says that Solomon's wisdom exceeded even their wisdom. And so that's obviously a benchmark that the Israelites had in their minds as someone who was extremely wise, and for Solomon to exceed them was a mark of ex extreme wisdom. So here we have these three men who are the singers or the chiefs of the singers of Israel, and unsurprisingly we find them composing psalms that make up a part of the songbook of Israel. Okay, that's all background. Any questions or comments or anything with regard to that, Greg? As far as you can tell, are all the singers of Israel Levites or just the leaders of the singers? Um, when we look at First Chronicles 15 as it lays it out, it indicates that, that these are Levites um, and that there are these leaders and then those under their direction um, and it actually specifies certain instruments that certain ones played and then it also mentions that other Levites had other works in the work of the temple and later, uh, the tabernacle and later the temple uh, and then it specifies of course that the sons of Aaron offered the sacrifices so yeah I think I think we're talking here about um, Levites you brought that up and I'm going to go ahead and say this I had not planned to delve off into this but in 1st Chronicles chapter 2 when the chronicler is giving the line of Judah there are also an Ethan and a Heman <laughs> who are descendants of a man whose name might fit with the idea of an Ezraite the only problem is they're from Judah and there's really no reason to attach them to these people or to the writers of these psalms. Nothing that I can find. Uh, but that does seem to come up from time to time. Uh, as far as I can tell, we're talking about Levites. If, if uh, Levite married someone from the tribe of Judah, do they cease being a Levite lineage or is it? Depends on their gender. Oh, okay. In other words, a woman from Judah who married a Levite her children would be reckoned to be yeah. Levites. Okay. Uh, but a woman from Levi who married a man from Judah, her children would be reckoned to be from the tribe of Judah. Yeah. So it would be the, the patriarchal line, I guess you would say. It's best I understand. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Well, but the, that means it could both be true. This could be true even though they're not. 
except that they have different fathers when we read the genealogies. Yeah. So, so I think we just have people from different tribes who had the same name, just like their John's all over the place today, things of that nature. I wish I could give you a satisfactory answer of what an Ezraite is. I haven't found one. If you find one, I'd be happy to hear about it. <laughs> all right. There's our background. Now, let's go to the text. I told you I wasn't going to get through all this tonight. All right. So Psalm 88, then, the writer is this man who's identified as Heman the Ezraite, whom we believe is this singer of Israel. Timeline-wise, then, this would put him somewhere in the reign of David, possibly the reign of Solomon, since Solomon was compared to them for wisdom. Maybe even outlive Solomon. Remember, Solomon reigned for 40 years. If we figure that we're 10 years into the 40-year reign of David when he sets these up, depending on their age, if they live to be very old, they might have even outlived Solomon. I have a reason for saying that, so don't forget that. But uh, This is... Uh, what we call a mascal. Remember when we talked about the different types of psalms when we introduced the book? A mascal is, is a contemplation or a reflection. This particular one is very, very interesting because it has a very close affinity to the book of Job. And so we might say that it's a reflection or a contemplation on the book of Job, the story of Job, what have you, there's so much connection between this psalm and the book of Job that some of the commentators have even suggested that it, Heman might have been one who had a hand in recording the story of Job as we have it in the biblical canon. Uh, remember the story of Job is the story of a man who probably lived during the patriarchal period and may have been a contemporary of Abraham. And it's not too far outside the bounds of reasonableness to imagine that this was a story that was handed down orally for a number of generations and eventually was recorded by inspiration for the biblical canon. Who recorded it, we don't really know. Could it have been some of these uh, singers of Israel during this really zenith of, of Israelite uh, writing and thinking and things of that nature, it's entirely possible. If that happened, it's not too terribly difficult to imagine that if Heman had a hand in recording it, that he might have had some thoughts on the subject that he was inspired to record and that that may be what Psalm 88 is, is a reflection on the plight of Job. These two divisions that I've given you where I compare verses from Psalm 88 to passages from Job, the, the blue with the L, this is where there are some very close language similarities. The L is for linguistics. Uh, between these verses in the psalm and these verses in Job. The T stands for thoughts. In these verses, there are some direct thought equivalents between these verses in the psalm and these verses in the book of Job. And you'll see what I mean when we start looking at the text. If we read the heading, it indicates also that it is set to possibly the tune of Mahalath Leniath. I have no idea what that sounded like. I will suggest to you that at least one commentator says this is not a tune, but rather this is a Hebrew notation that indicates that this was to be recited with sadness. Recited with sadness. Oh, interesting thought. Clearly it's a poem at any rate. Now, if we break it down in terms of, of an outline or structure, the first seven verses, and then verses 8 through 12, and then verses 13 through 18 kind of group the psalm into three major divisions. In the first seven verses, we have what we might call a wailing suppl uh, supplication, a prayer to God. Listen to what he says here. O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves. 
Now, right off the bat, notice the tone of this song. It's very, very uh, coming from a place of suffering and pain, isn't it? But in his suffering and pain, the psalmist is going to God, and look at how he addresses him back in verse 1. O oh Lord, God of my salvation. It indicates there some sort of a hope or trust that God will see him through whatever affliction he's in and that God will deliver him from this affliction. Hence the word salvation here. Uh, but he is in affliction, as he says in the latter part of verse 1, I cried out day and night before you. Sort of sounds like some of David's psalms, doesn't it? Where he indicates that he's crying to God uh, not just once, but over and over and over again. I've cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. Interesting sentiment that's suggested there. Because, of course, when God's people pray to God, he hears our prayers. What he doesn't always do is grant the things we ask for or grant them right away. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says not right now. Sometimes we tend to express those times from our point of view by saying something like, God didn't hear my prayer. Well, in the sense that he hears what his people are praying, he certainly did. What he didn't do is grant our prayer. But that language is sometimes used. For example, uh, remember when Moses was told that he couldn't go into the land of Canaan because he had not upheld God before the people and he had struck the rock instead of speaking to it? He told the Israelites that he begged God to let him set foot into the land of Canaan and he did not hear my prayer. Now, Moses is expressing that from his own point of view, not from the absolute that God did not hear what Moses was saying to him, but that God didn't grant his prayer. On the other hand, you remember uh, Hezekiah was told by Isaiah, you're dying. You're going to die. Get your affairs in order. God says you're going to die. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he wept and he prayed. And the Lord told Isaiah, I have heard his prayer. Of course, the sense there is that I'm going to grant his prayer. And he did. He gave him 15 more years of life. So understand sometimes when we talk about God hearing a prayer, we're not talking in the absolute sense in which God obviously hears the prayers of his people and is attentive to them. But sometimes we talk about it from the point of view of the prayer in the sense of whether God has granted or has yet granted the prayer. And I think that's what's going on here. I told you all we were going to get through this. Um, let my prayer come before you incline your ear to my cry for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave if in fact this is a reflection on Job remember Job asked several questions and one of those questions was why couldn't I have died before I was born and if that didn't work why couldn't I die when I was born and if that didn't work, why can't I die now? I mean, he was in absolute misery. And so it's not at all a stretch if this is a reflection on Job's situation to say, my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. And, verse 4, I'm counted with those who go down to the pit, the grave, Sheol, Hebrew word there. I'm like a man who has no strength, but drift among the dead. Boy, isn't that picturesque? Like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. Again, talking from the point of view of the person here. You, Lord, have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves. Remember Job's complaint to God throughout the book is, Lord, why are you letting me suffer like this? I haven't done anything wrong. 
And the reason he's saying that is because his three friends are over there saying to him, Job, if you weren't such a wicked sinner, God wouldn't let you suffer like this. And Job's whole point is, I haven't done anything. Why am I suffering? Um, and so this certainly could be a reflection on what Job has to say. Now, I would love to dig into the next section, but we don't have time. So I'm sorry. We'll have to put a peg down there at verse 8, and we'll come back there next week, and Lord willing, get through that, and somehow or another, all 52 verses of Psalm 89. But we'll do our best. Thank you so much for your attention.